Hello everyone, I'm Troy Dodds and welcome to the On The Record podcast presented by The Western Weekender. On this podcast, I'm joined by special guests who all have such great stories to tell about Penrith and the role they've played in our city. Today, my special guest is Matthew Jones. During the 1990s, Matt had one of the highest profile jobs in Penrith as the owner and licensee of the famed Daily Planet nightclub. It's time to relive some memories of $1 drinks, celebrity appearances and incredible nights on High Street. I'm sure it'll be a fascinating chat. Matt, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me in, mate. Appreciate it. As always, we start with the question, where were you born and uh, where did you grow up? Mate, born in Carlingford, um, obviously 1966, and I uh, was there for a period of two years, and then my parents and I all moved up to Parks, to their first hotel up in Parks. Yep, okay. So your parents very involved in the in the pub and hospitality game from, from for as long as you've known? Yeah, 100%. Like they, my, my family have always been involved in, in hotels, and that's where I got pretty much my main starts, you know, from, from uh, hospitality and learning from uh, where we started off from um, and, and how we moved forward to the, you know, the nightclub areas. So where do you, when does Penrith come into your life? Where do you, uh, when do you move to this, this part of the, the, uh, the Sydney area? We moved into the uh, Penrith area in 1974 and we purchased the Penrith Hotel just at the top of the high street. And um, yeah, we, we had that, I think, for 27 to 28 years. And what was Penrith like then, in uh, growing up in the seventies and, and early eighties in uh, in the Penrith area? It was a small country town, mate. They yeah. said uh, the police station was like uh, a size of a house, and and the and the jail was like the size of a toilet block. We had uh, Neil's next door to us. We had like, yeah, it was very country, but everybody knew each other in in, in that area. And like you said, you know, when we started off, beers were yeah you know, around about twenty five to thirty cents a <laughs> schooner. So you can see where it's come from there. Now, of course, um, we'll talk about how you get involved with the Penrith Hotel um, and then, of course, the Daily Planet later, but you actually start life as a, as a butcher. Uh, how, how did that come about? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the parents and mum and dad, very tough uh, publicans in them days, they said, look, you know, if anything ever happens to us, we don't want you to rely on the hotel industry. So, uh, yeah, dad said, get out of school and, and get into, uh, into butchering, which uh, dad was a bit of a meat uh, person in, in his day. So uh, we, he introduced me to Nick Peters and I kicked off with Peters Meats at Kmart, the old uh, Leagues Club site. Yeah, okay, wow. Well, and, of course, um, I think uh, Peter's Meats was there for, for decades to, to follow. So. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was yeah, a, yeah. Fair, fair, fair few years. And then uh, did that uh, for about four or five years and then uh, went even further down the meat game to Riverston Abattoirs and became a uh, boner down in yeah, down the Abattoirs there for a bit. Now, talking of the Penrith Hotel, so at this time you're doing that, your family's owning the Penrith Hotel – Interesting location, particularly in those days when, when Penrith wasn't as expansive as it is now, um, because it, it's it's a little bit out of that traditional Penrith CBD area that we think of. Was that was that a challenge for them to, to make it successful? Yeah, like when when we first bought the the hotel back in seventy four, pubs were a little bit different then, and you know all bars were being used, lounge bars, saloon bars, and and public bars. But as time got on, it was near impossible to make anybody turn left and go up the hill mm. in High Street. Uh, like we only really had like the police station and the post office were the only two things up there. But yeah, very very difficult and hence why we uh, decided later on down the track we needed to make a destinational venue um, come up for people to, to uh, start moving up to, up the hill. Now, 1993 is when I think you take over as licensee of the Penrith Hotel. So what happened there? Your parents are still involved, but how, how do you end up as the licensee there? Oh look, the the hotel wasn't you know faring too good at that in the in those days. Like I said, uh, and uh, I pretty much was asked by my mum and dad. They said, "Look, we want to we need to inject something into the into the property, and you've been here all your life. Um, what would you like to do?" And and that's pretty much where we first started off saying that yeah you know, we need to get some sort of a uh, destination. I want I've always wanted to do nightclubs. I used to go down to Panthers, yeah. down the old Roadworks, and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, I wanted to. Be my own because uh, that was you know my passion was music and and hospitality was was born into my system so that's where we all kicked off and what was the nightclub scene like you mentioned panthers there but what was you know you opened the daily planet two years later 1995 what what's the nightclub scene in penrith like at that time and the nightlife scene in general because i imagine it's it's a lot of heading into Parramatta and the city more than sticking around penrith 
Yeah, correct, correct. Look, in uh, in those days, they like said we started off, and the first one was called Bootleggers Nightclub, and uh, we we kicked that off. But at the same time, you, we had connections down the road. I think down at the uh, the, the Tats Hotel, you had the uh, God, I can't. Remember. What was the name? The Jungle Room? Yeah, Jungle Room. Yeah, the room. Jungle yes. Room. But the big ones, you know, said you had Patrick's at Pennant Hills and then you had also Castle Hill Tavern and a few of those sort of places that were, you know, destinational areas on certain nights. So the Daily Planet comes along in 1995. Now, we'll talk about, obviously, how successful it becomes, but I imagine, do you feel it's a gamble at the time? Like, do you feel confident that this is going to work, that Penrith needs this at this moment, or... What do you feel, Gee? This is this is all or nothing here, as far as this is concerned. Well, yeah, the first one, bootleg, as I said, that was a that was a sort of a, a, a furphy start. So then we we put a million dollars into that property and yeah. to get you know the, a going, and it, it sort of didn't go off as well as we we first expected. Uh, and it was because we just didn't have the right flavour. We didn't ha- have the right you know armoury uh, to attract all the people that we wanted to get in it. And then, as I said, a, um, a period of time after that. We uh, met up with um, a company um, which I highly, highly rate. You know, his name was uh, Harry Della, mm-hmm. and it was Rock Circuit Promotion. Uh, and that, that's the that's the gentleman that I really got into bed with, and we started getting into where I wanted to be, what I was trying to achieve, what he could do to help me. And, and as I said, RCP uh, at that stage, um, they they ran one of the biggest. They ran biggest nightclubs. They ran Club Troppo. They ran Patrick's at Pennant Hills. They were involved in Waves at Wollongong, all the big sites. So him and TCP, Total Concept Productions, which was Richard Skidinski, he uh, also came into the fold and uh, we had a design on the table, which was... Um, Fantastic, as far as we were concerned. Yeah, and then we got that's where we started the, our name off. Yeah, and so how did the name come about? Why the Daily Planet? Look, it, it was it's a, it was a hard one. We've sort of been going through all these different things of what we wanted to to get as a. Um, um, an icon or a figure mm. that people are easy to be relatable and we were just you know around one day and we saw a superman the superman booth and then we went hey the daily planet like that just gave a you know a bit of an idea for theming at the same time because like we had 77 tvs in there because yep. we were like planet tv we had you know the the superman you know box and all that sort of stuff in the telephone box before dc comics yep. decided to, to uh Sue me, <laughs> so we had to pull <laughs> oh, that wow, out. Okay. But yeah, that was where it pretty much came from. It was a collaboration of a lot, of, a lot of great companies that worked for me, um, and yeah, you know, right through to, to fruition to opening the, opening the club up. Now you've, you've brought in here a, a, an incredible collection of, of marketing materials and things like that that I've had a look through. And and one thing that stands out to me is that you almost ticked every box. Like you. you you're clearly a professional operator, but there was there was just so much that went into here's a procedure for this and here's this procedure and, and here's how this is going to work with a cloakroom and, and a bar and whatever else. So how important to you was to get those things right, not just to go, well, let's suck it and see, let's actually put all these processes in place uh, before we open. Yeah, well, once again, um, one thing that I was very lucky for in my time in the, in the Daily Platinum and the nightclub industry, I was guided by a lot of very uh, intelligent uh, people who have been in the game for a while, but we had to give the people in Penrith an experience that was exactly the same as the city. So if you go into the, into the city at that stage, you have to have a proper cloakroom, you have to have the right uniforms, you have to have the right staff. I end up doing my own security because, you know, I, I don't like, you know, the way it's, you know, some security were treating people in that day, so we brought yeah. our own in. And uh, we just got a really good gel going with, the, with, uh, with as you said, all, all the areas and locations that we had to fix up for customers to be a destinational club. So 1995, do you remember the opening night? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I don't know where I was sober at the end of it, but uh, <laughs> I, I do remember that it was um, something that made my hair stand on my, on my, uh, up on my neck and just to some of the music. I think we started off with Gangster's Paradise and, you know, back, back when Tupac was just starting off. So to see your club open up and to see, you know, the massive lines of people which still, you know, still amazes me to today. How many, how many people we had strung out the door in, in those areas? But to see it, it said it's a, it was a, it was an amazing and uh, an achievement for both me and my family. So Friday and Saturday nights, it essentially becomes the Daily Planet. 
No, it was Wednesday night. Oh, Wednesday night. Yeah, Wednesday, Wednesday night. Yeah. Wednesday night, very much a uni kind of night. Well, Wednesday, I started off as dollar drinks. Yes, okay. And hence my dad and he tried to kill me. He said, <laughs> how do we do a drink for a dollar? Yeah, which people still... So people still talk about the Daily Planet's one dollar drinks now, yeah. which is, you know, almost 30 years later. So that was obviously a way to get people in on a night they traditionally wouldn't have gone out. Correct, yeah, yeah. The, the dollar drinks things, because we knew we had Castle to Tavern on Thursday night and a couple of other, other clubs that were up against us, but the Wednesday night dollar drinks was a uh, a way that, you know, Penrith loves a value for dollar yep. and they love a drink. You know, what we used to see down at, you know, Panthers and stuff like that, you know, they were, they were uh, just smashing around and we said, well, we're going to do dollar drinks and... Yeah, there wasn't a real big RBT thing or you know, <laughs> RSA at that stage, so we got away with it. There was twenty six cups to a to a, uh, a tray of glasses, yeah. and uh, they were getting racks of them at one, at one <laughs> stage. But it was a lot of fun, and really, we never really had a lot of fights or dramas because people were socially it was midweek, so you know they all had to you know sort of get up for a job the next morning. But it gave them value for money, and uh, you know, as I said, hence. We, they were our, one of our major nines. We'd be doing, you know, fifteen hundred to two thousand people some some nights over the over the whole night. I imagine then the, the the planet really becomes the money spinner for the venue. But how how are you then managing the fact that it's it's the Penrith Hotel during the day? And it's the it's the Daily Planet a couple of nights a week. Well, as I said, yeah, during during uh, my time at the hotel, we found that the hotel was 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 drying, and a lot of hotels were dying in mm. in, in those areas. Um, gaming obviously brought a lot back, but we pretty much were on mainly clean up. <laughs> Yeah. You know, after the, after the, after a Wednesday night, you go through it all for, for them, you know, the next morning, and by the time you get everything done, so it's a bit of a clean up and, and get everything uh, started. But the public bar always did well, uh, and then, as I said, as we started off, uh, we, we we turned that into the high bar, mm-hmm. and uh, yep. that became our retro e type thing. We put pizzas on because we wanted pizza not to have to walk away and stuff like that. But it wasn't as busy, but it didn't really matter to us at that stage. Now, one of the good things about nightclubs of this era, one of the big sort of draw cards, was celebrity appearances. There's no no doubt about that. And it was no different here. And in fact, if you look back now and you think about the level of celebrities that you were attracting to Penrith, it's pretty remarkable. It's a it's a, it's a it's a big list of people, um, and, and a poignant one. Shane Warne, I know, was um, was out. Warne was there. Yeah, uh, he's fabulous. Yeah, and as I said, you know, God rest his soul. Uh, he's exactly how people have portrayed him. He's just the most amazing, energetic person in there. Loves everybody. Got behind the bar with the bar staff and amongst all the customers as well. So he was fabulous. But we had a, l- a massive list of of stars and that's what was the main attraction to to the planet was bring to Penrith you know everything that you possibly could from the city and this is an era of uh, home and away and neighbours are are at the, the peak of their their viewership so yes yeah, big big stars from from those shows come out as well right massive massive amount of, of stars that we had we had out of there like you know Chris Hemsworth Isla Fisher um got it I could, I could run through a list, you know, of all yeah. the people and acts that we had. It's, it's it's a quite comprehensive list. I think I saw a picture of Plucker Duck. He came out uh, one yeah. stage. <laughs> well, we had, you said, in those days, Hey Hey It's Saturday yeah. was massive. So. And it would have been a big lead in to the Daily Planet for people, you know, exactly. to be at home and, and watch Hey Hey, which is what everyone did, and then head out. Yeah, we had Plucker Duck. We had uh, we had Molly Meldrum. He even met Molly, was up, been up there a couple of times. Um, what was it? Russell Gilbert was yeah. there. Yeah. We had Red Simons was, was, was up there as well. Well, so yeah, anybody that was on TV, pretty much, we we try to get to the to the club. In those days, I'm just interested, you know, no no individual in particular, but what was that costing you to get a celeb out to a nightclub? Oh God, it, depending on the, on the, on the size of the celeb or, or, or what it was, but generally, you know, it could be a thousand, two thousand dollars, depending on the on, mm. on their hype or where they were sitting it at. But as I said, it was money well spent because it said it, it attracted and returned customers. We had Ian Taylor from uh, 1FM on the podcast uh, a few uh, episodes ago, and uh, 1FM is obviously big around this time as well in, in Penrith, and they were talking about, he was talking about how, you know, the celebs would obviously come out to Penrith, and it's not quite like these days where they'd be with 20 different hangers-on and, and all of that sort of stuff. Was that similar for you guys? I mean, you just, they just have a couple of people with them and well, get out, get out, manage to get out there themselves to Penrith? <laughs> no, funny enough, like, we had... An amazing little uh, person worked for me called Luke Ryan. Mm-hmm. Now Luke was synonymous in 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 the nightclub industry. Uh, he was a, was a um, like 
you know, a smaller size gentleman, yep. but everybody knew Luke. Now, he drove all the, the acts for us around, and obviously because we were connected with other nightclubs, uh, he had to do, you know, sometimes three and four different trips to different clubs over the time, but drink riders and stuff like that, they were, they were massive, you know, had to supply drink yep. riders, but we pretty much chauffeured our own, own guys around from, from one place to the other, and as I said, Luke was our main person that, that, that did all our celebrities. Any celebrity that really stands out for you is that was a really top person and a big success for for Daily Planet. Well, one of our funny stories that we uh, we loved loved to talk. We had Chris Hemsworth, you know, yep. uh, at, at our club and uh, during his ju- junior days. And mate, the guy was just infatuated with our glass washing machine and, and our <laughs> and our glasses. He couldn't understand how we could do so many you know dollar drinks and cups. And he was just amazing. So yeah, he was he was he was fabulous. Jamie Jury, yeah, he, he was a fabulous fabulous person as well. Um, Isaac Hayes was was an uh, international chef from South Park. He came over and and, and just just seeing the you know, the way they re- re- react and Penrith was just a great town. Yeah, you know, everybody mm. was you know, happy and, and and upbeat. So anybody that came out had a good time. Do you think those celebrity appearances were, I guess the the main thing that helped the Daily Planet be a success in that Penrith had never really had that before. Though, though that kind of situation had never existed where these celebrities were coming coming this way. So do you think that was one of the main draw cards? It was. It was a hundred percent is said it was a, a, a club that you could go to the best music. As I said, we, we had you know we had double DJs running. We had even when these guests come up, they are our celebrity DJs as well. But it was actually people can walk up and touch them and and like we used to come out and have like as I said our marketing and advertising. We we wanted to keep a little and often always. So mm. we used to take photos of them. We used to sign or autographs and stuff like that and uh, give them out to the customers. Take photos. It was just somewhere that you know they could actually say, hey, I, I met that person you know on the box. Yeah, it's, it was just more of a great. Vine. Everybody was you know, talking about it. What about? I'm not you know asking you to speak out of school here, but what about any bad celebrity experiences? Did you have any that were just like that was a, that was an absolute Look, disaster with this person? I am being told by a lot of my DJs prior to this this uh, podcast. <laughs> uh, you know, big shout out to Jay Knapp there as well to say nothing and uh, of what, <laughs> what what happened at Daily Planet stayed at Daily Planet. No one really got out of control because they were all out of control at that stage. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was a fun era. Like, there was not a lot of you know, issues or dramas in that stage. But, yeah, I couldn't put a point on it and, or, or drop someone under the, under the truck, mate. Talking of that era, no phones. I mean, I mean there is a photo, actually, of a, of a guy um, lined up with the big brick hanging off his, uh, his pants. Because um, you've got a lot of photos from that era, which is great, because a yeah. lot of people probably didn't take a lot of photos of their venues around that, um, that time. But no phones. No, it, was a, it was a different kind of vibe in, in clubs and whatnot, wasn't it? Because oh. you, you weren't there to, to, sh- to tell everyone else you were there <laughs> in terms of photos and videos and whatnot. And, and I guess that made it a, a, a funner, looser experience. Well, mate, it's, it's funny you said it. It's a, we were only discussing this the other day that, um, with phones and everything nowadays, they're really taking selfies and everybody's making you know social yeah. media. There wasn't a camera, so yeah. people weren't interested in taking selfies of themselves. We had a, a full time you know photographer come through the property at, at that stage and later on, two years into it, that's when the Nokia came out. We we were allowed to SMS <laughs> with 156 yeah, yeah. characters and stuff. Thirty like cents that. a pop or so whatever it was. But yeah. I, I, look, yeah, it was, it was weird. We're only just saying, my God, when we started, like there was no not yeah, you know, we had to have photos and people waited for the photos. Photos to come yeah. out, you know, the following week on on our uh, big photo boards at the front. And as far as celebs are concerned, today's selfie was probably the autograph. Then it was all about the autograph. Get the autograph. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, that, it's, it's it's true. But this way, as I said, we did a lot of lot of marketing and a lot of you know printing and stationery and stuff like. That. We used your paper, yep. yeah, you know, amazingly a lot to get that out. That yeah, you know, we used to have you know a hundred photos and we used to do a a, a collage of them. Yeah, and you guys used to advertise them and spot your photo. You get free entry. Anything we could work out to, yeah. to market it was, was, was the way it was. You talk about marketing, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, like I think you did some incredible marketing. You really nailed it during that period because, and you had to, didn't you? There's no Facebook. There's no, you know, word of mouth is a lot slower than it is today. Um, so, so what else were you using? Obviously, using all the print media in town at that time. Yeah, the weekend of the Penrith Press, the Penrith Star, all big. Um, what else was was sort of grabbing people in and, and heading them up to High Street? Well, one thing that Penrith had never seen, which really amazed me, was pole posters. Yeah, and you know we. Uh 
absolutely obliterated you know, pole posters through through the you know, Glenmore Park, through the areas of towns. Um, that was a major, major, dra- uh, major, major kick for us as far as getting our awareness. Then we obviously did a lot of radio, you know, radio you know, snippets and grabs. We did a lot of work with Triple M at mm-hmm. that stage, and then, you know, at Club Veg, where we you know, Mick and Mal uh, were, were one of our closest uh, friends, used to come out a lot. But yeah, I think more than anything, it was the poll posters, word of mouth, and then the just consistency of the quality of the club, which resonated with you know people and kept them coming back in their droves. Now, obviously, given that it's so successful, other people look around and go, "Oh, maybe I could do this too." Did you have competition pop up during the time that the planet was around? Look, no such thing as competition, but you know, my my theory was any competition's good competition. We we encouraged uh, or we increased a lot of other b- businesses because of mm. the amount of flow of traffic. Yeah, you know, we had through our property, like I think the pin you know, kebabs and pizzas. Yeah. Was, the guy <laughs> was really driving around in Bentley, yeah, because <laughs> the amount of pizzas and stuff. But yeah, you know, like even connections that that sort of picked up a little bit, and the jungle room. But we never really had any real. Um, uh, com- competition because the competition was our other clubs that we actually ran, being Patrick's or or Waves or something mm. like that. We were already connected to. And what about um, that that kind of year, that late nineties, early two thousands era? Because Penrith is is changing during that period. Glenmore Parks popped up, so you'd, you'd be noticing some pretty significant change happening around you uh, in the city itself during that time too. Olympics are, are obviously happening with the Whitewater Stadium being built, so pretty crazy time in Penrith in general. Yeah, no, amazingly. See, when I first came to the town, it was a very small town. But I think, you know, when we were halfway through our, our planet, there was like 400 to 500,000 people in, in, in the in the Penrith area. And with the Olympics coming up, everything was just getting hyped and, you know, and big, bigger and bigger for it. We actually, you know, when the Olympics came, we, we hired the old casino out and took all our bar staff down and did a New Year's Eve gig down in uh, Sydney and had Madison Avenue um, yeah, come, and, okay. come and perform for us and did the, the show. So, yeah, big, big times. It was, it was, it was fun. I just think, you know, in the era that we're in, we didn't have as many dramas as they do today. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, yeah, everyone was just looking for a bit of fun. What about dramas and issues? Like, we know that... Um you know, clubs in Penrith have often been a problem. Penrith police are probably happy that there's no dedicated nightclub here at the moment. What was the relationship with the cops like? I mean, they're just down the road. So. Oh, yeah, as I said, that was, there's good points and bad points. As I said, anybody that we, we put out for RSA or anything, yep, they go straight to the police station because yeah. it was just on the way down to the to the next place. So yeah. we were the brunt of a lot of stuff that uh, that went through it. Licensing police just didn't like me. Like, it was, yeah, we yeah. can't get around it. I think your name is Kerry Smith at that stage. Uh, they just kept putting you know, barriers up. You can't do this, can't do that. So anything they came up against, we brought in wristbands. We actually started RSA up in, in the Penrith area when the AHA started, duty of care and stuff like that. So just following the rules yeah. was uh, was what we tried to do. But, yeah, a lot of police presence. Uh, as far as the bike groups, yeah, we had a couple of, you know, we had the, the Nomads and the Rebels, they were regulars up there, but they were just very, very respectful, you know, people. They ne- never ever caused us dramas or, or, or problems um, because we had our own security and the customer felt safe. We got a lot of, uh, you know, dramas out of the way mm. prior to it because we were aware of them. So, and that's the other thing. that We made, you know, the girls feel very comfortable in the property. Yep. What about one of the great myths that surround the Daily Planet, which is uh, this meningococcal outbreak that happens in Penrith in, in the mid to late 90s, and it's traced back to you. Yeah. But... I, you know, from what I understand, that was pretty much that was pretty unfair, and is a bit a bit of a myth. It didn't it didn't start there at all. Uh, no, it never started. It was never a part of the club. But we got wrangled in because um, the um, the incident happened or was found out within you know in the midweek area, and everybody visited our property, hmm. and this meningococcal thing actually started up at uh, St Mary's up in Ripples yep. with some people that were actually up there. And I think they may have sh- shared a cigarette or something to that to that effect and they just happened to be at my club that night and it uh, it just exploded from there it, I've never ever experienced 
anything as painful as, yeah. as that. You know, like, you know, stabbing shootings in a nightclub, they're normal. Airborne diseases, it came back. So it crosses a bomb. Absolute crosses yeah. a bomb to get a marketing team in to reprogram it. And, you know, so is that what you have to do? You pretty much go, hey, we're in crisis PR mode here and, and we need to turn right. this around. Days, it was yeah. twenty five to 30000 to get in a company to, to bring you back online and getting straight on the front foot. I came down the next day at 2GB, uh, two, uh, Triple M, 2Day FM, Channel 7. Everybody was just you know, at my front door and you're trying to explain it never happened here yeah. uh, and no one got copped it. But, hey... We got over. We got over it eventually, and yeah. uh, but it was it was really funny. I mean, like really quick, quick story is that we had to take all the staff up to the up to the, the hospital and give them all their tablets. Thing was, these tablets made you urinate gold, and <laughs> you stand at one end of the trough and uh, have a go to the toilet, and at the other end you got a customer going. This just doesn't look right, <laughs> but yeah, no, we got over it. But it was a it was a hard hard slog. But we you know, the people of Penryn, as I said, they you know. Made made sure that we we stay stayed ahead above water. Talking of staff, what was it, what was it like for them working at the planet at the time? Um, I know I've seen some of the the cool uniforms and the uh, the shirts that used to go around the the um, you know that declared that it's not a very politically correct venue. So there was there's a, there's a great shirt actually. I mean I don't know if you've still got any. It'd be good to. Uh, uh, reproduce them today. I think you'd probably get in trouble for wearing them, but um, you had a bit of fun with with staff and, and and that as well. Probably just ahead of the cancel culture era, but things were obviously starting to sneak in given some of the lines on that on that shirt. Yeah, my my staff. Um, I, I I couldn't be a more happier person. It was a, like a family uh, type um, atmosphere always. Um, we always encouraged our staff to, you know, you know, be happy, be up, you know, if there's dramas. Um, we used to take them away on ski trips. A lot of those people that worked for me were good friends of mine at the same time. But the culture was amazing. It was, you know, like they, they knew that they were working in an elite nightclub. They realised, you know, the entertainment they saw each week was, was amazing. Um, and it was just great all around. I, I don't think we had a lot of staff go through there. There was a, mm. there was a lot of them, but the culture was just fabulous. It was just a totally different culture. And, mate, Wednesday nights, I found out I had a couple of hairdressers. So yes. we did free haircuts. Yes, I've seen some photos now. Yeah, hair, hair, Very rare that you're going to get a, a hairdresser in a nightclub. But, yes, you could, you could go to the Daily Planet, have your dollar drink, and uh, then head up and get a haircut. It was it was funny and like some of the stuff you saw out of that floor. We were doing you know thirty and forty haircuts. Well, I wasn't. The girls were, <laughs> but but yeah, you know, there was some guys getting some serious haircuts done. But it was just something that it, it came up by chance, and we just threw it out there, and it became one of the one of the most yeah you know, popular things we used to put on. There'd have to be some stories around too about I guess people who've met at the Daily Planet and since got married had kids and and whatnot. I mean I don't know if you know any, but uh, surely there's stories out there. <laughs> there's a lot of people out there yeah. saying that we met. You know, I met my my husband. I met my wife there. There was also a lot of people that we took photos of that they weren't husband and wife at that stage. <laughs> they're ringing to just get us, get their photo off the front board. But it's I mean where we ever go. And one thing I say about Penrith, it, it's a very communal uh, communal town and. No one forgets anything. So you'd be mm. going getting a haircut and, oh, you haven't seen you for years. You know, this person you know, met there, they've had a couple of kids now. So, yeah, there was a lot of communication and a lot of connections in them days. Do you still talk to any of the staff today and talk oh, to yeah. any of them? Yeah, yeah 100%. I, uh, I am in communication with some of the DJs, some of the bar staff, because there's still you know, locals in, in Penrith and you know, get around and, and, and talk about the old days yeah. sort of thing for a bit of time. But, yep, yeah, have, have a lot of them. What about you? Did you feel like you're a bit of a celebrity yourself during this period? Because, uh, you know, I mean, you're owning the, the biggest nightclub in town, the most popular place in town. <laughs> how, did, how did that feel for you on a couple of nights a week? Dude, I was a rock star at that stage. <laughs> I, had, I had the best lifestyle, I had the best area, I had the best team working for me. I didn't have to work so hard on the actual nights. It was more of a social thing. But I was allowed in any place, nightclub, Aria Awards, yeah. you know, like, you know, friends of mine who had hotels, Chris Chung, Coogee Bay Hotel, you could go anywhere. And as I said, in that, those days, it was, was uh, you're, you're known for, you know, certain areas. So, yep, gu- guaranteed I had the best 10 years, mate, of, of <laughs> any young man's life, I can tell you. Now, what's interesting to me, given the Daily Planet's huge reputation in Penrith, given people still talk about it today, is it closed in 2003. So, in reality... Eight nine years of uh, of life. Let's talk about why it closed. Was it was it something that you saw coming? Was it a sudden decision? What 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 brought down the curtain on the planet? Well, look, 
we did over 1.3 million people in the club in that in that time. And like I said, 10 years of, of working in there from, you know, we just got tired and we were offered a um, considerable amount of money for the property mm. um, when, you know, we bought it for 900000 back in 1974. We were offered a considerable amount and mum and dad and everybody said, well, hey, what do you think? You know, better for our, our health or, or to move on? I never want to finish. They did. So <laughs> <laughs> I'd be still there doing it today. But, um, yeah, it was more, I think it was more that, you know, a better lifestyle for my mum and dad. And they'd done a lot. And, you know, mum was travelling a fair bit. And I understand, you know, someone has to count and bank and wash and clean all that money. Yeah. Um, and not wash it. In it, yes. uh, it was absolutely sticky. We had to clean yeah. every note because we put, couldn't put them. But, yeah, we we but, don't mean washing Ozark style. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely not. But uh, it was, it was, it was just so much work, you know. And at the end of it, uh, we felt that uh, it was a good time. Go out in a high, don't go out in a low. And um, we moved on. The actual the Overland Hotel Group bought bought the pub okay. Not many people would be in that position where. It's closing at the top of its game. Normally, it'd be well. Things aren't looking good here. Let's make a let's make a call. What was the reaction like from uh, from the people of Penrith and your regulars when when it became clear that uh, the planet was going to close? A lot of shock and a lot of uh, questions. Um, at the same time, I didn't get a lot of um, you know fall, fall, fallout from it. Uh, the last night that we had there was absolutely one of our biggest nights. Mm. Like you said, the line went around the corner. Um, I, we had a good vibe all the way through, and I think people were just more sad than anything that it wasn't going to be their regular. They weren't going to meet all their, their their social friends at there, and, and it was more of a breaking up of, of a group sort mm. of thing. What about that closing night? Oh, um, wow. Do you, <laughs> how much do you remember of it? Oh, look, I think I got to about... You know, eleven thirty, twelve o'clock, and yeah, it it, it wasn't a, bla- a blank for me, but it was a lot of fun and uh, a lot of emotions uh, going through it. It was not till you know a couple of days later that you're actually pulling down the speakers and you're removing things, and you uh, that's mm. when it really hits you that wow, it's it's uh, it, it's it's finished up. Yeah, and, and I guess yeah, that's that's a. When you look back on it now, do you go, well, that was the best eight, nine years yep. of, of my career? Do you, do you feel that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I have. Uh, yeah, you still have your dreams about, yeah, about, yeah, yeah. about it. But I, uh, when, when we moved, moved from there um, and moved into the city, we had, we had another nightclub down in the city. We, we did some work down there. It was just different. You know, as I said, mm. the, the, the year of the, the, the 90s um, into the 2000s. Great era, great, great time, you know. So, yeah, I do miss it, but, uh, yeah. Uh, given the collection we spoke about earlier, of marketing stuff you've still got here, you, you did put up a Facebook page a couple of years back with all these photos, hundreds of photos, of, of and they're great to look back on. Um, I sense that, yeah, you, you really did hang on to this. This was a, this is a really important thing for you and, and something that you think of regularly? Well, yeah, we did. Well, look, we tried to do a few other things after it, being you know, a couple of people in Penn said they wanted to sort of try it off. But yeah, look, once you do something correctly, the right way with the right people, to re- reinvent it again or, or re- re- uh, recast it again, it's, ne- it's near impossible. What you hinted at there, your nightclub world doesn't finish with the Daily Planet in Penrith because you, you did consult on some other other openings Look, in Penrith as lots. well? we did lots. We did lots. We started off um, all these days in the greens, those winery trips yep. and stuff like that. We, we brought those we brought those on, 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 on roll. We had Stevie Nicks and um, Richard Clapton. We did Bin Badge in Estate where we got you know four or five semi-trailers and took them up to different wineries. Yep. The staff that worked for me, because they were so proficient, we had you know, great stuff they came with us we did casinos we've done consulting at other other nightclubs i went down to the point hotel did some work down there yeah but good good pub in piermont oh good, great yes. pub yeah, yeah great pub in piermont and then i eventually bought the uh the agent court hotel opposite bar broadway and believe it or not went into uh metal heavy metal and yeah. and, uh, and grunge <laughs> type type thing so we had three floors of that but Never, never, yeah, it was a, was a shadow of what we did, we did prior. And I think you did some work. Did you do some work with the Embassy here in Penrith as well at one Embassy stage? Embassy Nightclub, yeah, yes. Yeah. That, that was a, that was a, a weird old one. It was sort of, 
don't know. Followed the concept, though, of the Wednesday nights became sort of a big night. Yeah. Well, yeah. We, we used to, um, during my time you know, in the nightclub, as I said, I was connected to everybody. And there was a company, there was a business down in um, Rush Coast Bay called Embassy, which was named, uh, owned by Rennie Rifkin. Mm-hmm. So we ended up doing that, moving the name you know, and buying it and putting it on that uh, hotel. Uh, it just didn't seem to work, whether it be the, the staff, being the management, being the location. And also... Nothing works upstairs. If you try and yeah. get a nightclub to work upstairs, very, very hard to yeah. sort of get it yeah. going. But we tried for, for, for a bit of time and then uh, the owners and I decided to part ways because they went on the same sort of journey that I wanted to take it on as well. Interestingly, Penrith um, doesn't really have a, a nightclub these days. There's a few places that you can go and dance and whatnot into the night. But um, we've had you know a couple of attempts. There was Block and Friction and um, and Minx as well at Panthers. Panthers have had a few attempts at it over the years. Why do you think today there doesn't seem to be one? Like why why can it not work today, but it works so well in the nineties? Well, look. As I've seen it in, in lots and lots of areas. People get a bit of cash in their pocket and they say, oh, look, I can run a hotel, I can run a nightclub. Unless you're born into the industry hmm. and you know the industry back to front uh, and you can uh, foresee dramas and properties uh, coming up, um, that's where they, they, a lot of them fall over. At the same time, people don't realise how expensive they are to, to run, like you know, your security wages, your bar hmm. wages, your, your bottles, you know, and just keeping the consistency. And if people can't keep the marking, the consistency, and the people coming through the doors, they're not going to work. They're going to start cheapening off in, in areas. But we're the best quality of everything in that, and that's what I think. If Penrith is a quality town, then it's growing bigger and bigger, and they're seeing a lot more. If someone wants to do it, it will work 100% in, 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 in there. Yeah. I'll, I'll, look, the, the, the log cabin prior yeah. to that closing, yeah. we had a great affiliation with the Sinclair, Ross Sinclair, and you know, he had a good pub. And mm. it was a good venue, it was a good destination. He was a good operator at the same time. I think in, you know, the Laundy Hotel that's going to open up could possibly be one of the best pubs around in the areas. Um, you know, what it was, the um, pub over in Emi Plains, O'Donoghue's. Hughes, yeah. They yeah. tried it, but as I said, I can't stand bad security and bad management. And, yeah. and that's what people, you know, bring to the table. They, they don't look at their management, they become lazy. And, yeah, that's, if you want to be good at nightclubbing, you've got to be good at everything and be on, on board 24-7 and listen to your customers and listen to what's going on. Now, obviously, post-Daily Planet, um, apart from those few little bits and pieces, you kind of moved on from, from Penrith. Yep. Um, do you come back here often? And if you do, do you ever drive past uh, the old uh, Penrith Hotel and have a look? Yeah, I've walked into the pub uh, and had a look at it. It became a TAB and a, and a kid's area. Area sort of thing. So, yeah. uh, the the structure's still all there. That's really mm. funny. You know, like you know the 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 octagonal areas, the high bay area. We used to put the DJs and look. I walk into the place and just image what what was there yeah. when I used to live above the property at, at the same time. So it's a bit sad, but uh, it, it, I'm, I'm sure someone will come in and and do a big one. You know, shortly. These days, of course, you're not in the pub game anymore. No, no, yeah, no. Complete. complete uh, twist i guess in what you're doing these days yeah I, i'm environmental trading now so when we we're doing the nightclub we uh started off a campaign when malcolm turnbull was the uh the environment minister and we worked at a, an area how to uh do carbon trading and do carbon offsets using lighting and and, and as their area and last five to ten years i've been doing that it's funny because i've been involved with all my old publicans and uh, yeah. hoteliers because we go in there and and uh, show them how to be environmentally friendly and and, and and fix up their utilities bills but look i get to see my family now i didn't get to see much of them during that 10 years i was going to ask you that it must have been difficult you know at your age at that point that is traditionally a time a lot of people are settling down yeah. um you're what 30 you know in your 30s during yeah, the daily 30s, planet yeah. time so people are settling down you're ramping up uh, so how difficult was it from a family perspective? Oh, look, we had some stages there. We had my daughter growing up at that stage. We we actually you know, fitted out one of the strong rooms with, with lambswool sheet cover yeah. and uh, <laughs> put a little speaker in there for her and uh, the security all had a baby monitor and uh, we used to be able to hear if there was something in, but we used to live up above above the property and, you know, the kids, you know, Loved it. You, know, you yeah. imagine three kids up there. Yeah, okay, they, so you were living above the, the Penrith Hotel at the time. Living above it yeah. at, at the same time. So, you know, the kids used to go to, to bed on the, on the sound of a bass beat or, you know, yeah. a bass beat. So they, <laughs> and believe it or not, they, they found it hard and difficult to sleep. Funny, funny that. Yeah. To sleep after we'd left there without the fire brigade going off every 20 <laughs> seconds and police cars whipping past. But, yeah, look, the kids grew up in, in the industry and, as uh, I said, um, your family is, is, is your strongest, strongest tool. And uh, I, 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 I miss 
both being in hotels and with my family because I think we could have uh, moved into a, another another space with the kids because the amount of music my kids are into now, yeah. I know they do well. Yeah, a C- couple of questions about that era too. These days, obviously, is it is it much different from what you know as far as just drinks in general? The the, the what people were drinking, how has that evolved over the over the time? Like, what were they mainly drinking at the at well, the planet? Of course, beer never cost me seven bucks. Yeah, back then, like yeah. I was selling a, a bourbon for a dollar. Like beers nowadays, it's seven dollars. Yeah. That's that's a big thing. Uh, the the price uh, of, of drinks nowadays. Uh, it still baffles me to, yeah. to you know, the excise takes and, and how much people are charging out there. And, and believe it or not, they, they're shooting themselves in the foot because they want these kids to come to these venues. Mm. A lot of them don't have a, a ton of cash. And uh, the the difference now is 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 the uh, the drug and amphetamine scene. That's yeah. where, where you start. You know, did, did you face I mean, that issue at all in the daily We started planet? to. Yeah, we, we started yeah. to. But we saw the difference of uh, of our stock. And that's where we became around. We, you know, we, we, we uh, had, you know... 40, le- 40 drums of bourbon go through our property a month and 60 drums of vodka. When you start, when it starts joking up and you're starting to get pallets of water, yeah. you start you know, <laughs> asking the questions and, as I said, just onto it and into it and uh, making sure you control it. You know, it's, it's a necessary evil, yeah. but, yeah, as long as you control it. But to the, to the state it is nowadays, it's, it's nothing like yeah. that. That's why I said it was a fun time. You drank, you know, and, and, uh, and, and had, a, had, a, had a time that way. Because I feel like these days if you were doing a, a pub or a nightclub or whatever, you know, you a lot of attention has to go to that that cocktail list or yeah. or this this range. Was that really an issue in, in the nineties, or was it was it really just your classic spirits and beer was the was the main thing that you were selling? We had, we look we had a cocktail bar and it went off really well, but it was more drinks and shots. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it was a simple area. It's, it's beer to a certain time. Yeah, you know, then you straight on your bourbons, you know, your vodkas. Yeah. Uh, no, no craft beers doing the rounds in those days. No either. craft beers, <laughs> cruises, and, and, yeah, and Sub yeah. Zero uh, were the, were the main Ruskies thing. Yeah, what, ta- what colour yeah. tongue have I got? You know, <laughs> have we, and the Ruskies, you said. Yeah. It, it, was, it was an RTD, you know, like a, a ready to drink type yeah, thing. Yeah. We had a can bar. We, we, we changed the nightclub three times, so we upgraded it three times. Okay. So one time where the DJ box was, ended up becoming a can bar. That was just massive. We used to go through four or five hundred cans yeah. uh, in, in, a, in a period of you know, two or three hours. Yeah. Yeah, look, a fascinating time, a fascinating time in uh, in Penrith. Uh, the question we always ask at the end is how you'd like to be remembered. I'll ask that about you, but also the planet. How would you like people to remember the Daily Planet, and how would uh, you like them to remember you? It's already happened. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a simple question. Everybody uh, remembers me and and our staff at the Daily Planet and and how much fun you know we had there. And actually, the the, the planet itself, you know, it's it was one of the most fabulous fun you know fun I've ever you know had in my entire you know life. Awesome. Well, look, it's a, look, fantastic venue. I think that there are more people today that talk about the Daily Planet and going there that probably ever actually went there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, that ten, those things tend to happen. But uh, look, a, a really important time uh, in Penrith and a fun time in Penrith. I think that's the the most important it thing. It was. Yeah. And that's what it's supposed to be. Hospitality is supposed to be fun and, and a safe environment to, to, to be in. Matt, thank you very much for joining us and uh, all the best for the future. My pleasure and thanks very much. And I hope you enjoyed our chat. A reminder that On The Record is released every Monday. Just search Western Weekender wherever you listen to podcasts and hit the subscribe button. On The Record is produced by The Western Weekender and recorded at the studios of My88. Check out westernweekender.com.au and we'll see you next time.